Hello, and welcome to this audio edition of Moments in History, as seen on Oxford Academics X feed at OUP History. My name is Jack Dugan. Forty years ago, in March 1984, the National Coal Board, backed by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, announced the closure of 20 collieries in Britain, with the majority in the north of England, Scotland and Wales. Arthur Scargill and the National Union of Miners responded with a nationwide strike. The strike caused an enormous amount of unrest, with riots breaking out between police and picket lines, including the infamous Battle of Orgreave, where 94 picketers were arrested and many wounded. With the NUM divided and the strike failing to match the impact of the earlier strike in 1972, miners returned to work in March 1985. After the year-long strike, thousands lost their jobs, collieries were closed, and many areas struggled to recover from pit closures. The result was considered a major victory for Margaret Thatcher and the Conservative government, curbing union power and maintaining their economic strategy. In 1983, Britain had 173 working collieries. By 2015, there were none. By October this year, the current Conservative government plans to have a coal-free energy supply. To reflect on the 40th anniversary of such a transformative moment in modern British history, we're joined today by OUP authors Jörg Arnold, Natalie Tomlinson and Stephen Brooke to discuss the miners' strike and the wider context of Britain in the 1980s. Our first guest is Jörg Arnold, Assistant Professor of Contemporary History at the University of Nottingham and the author of The British Miner in the Age of Deindustrialization: A Political and Cultural History. Welcome along, Jörg. How are you today? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. It's been a pleasure uh, to be on the programme and to be discussing the miners' strike with you. Yes, so 40 years ago this month, the 1984 miners' strike began. Can you tell us a little bit more about the build-up to 1984 and the miners' strike and sort of when did the deindustrialization process start and sort of what was the state of the collieries by the time this all started? Yes, of course. Um, I think as a preliminary reflection, it might help to introduce two distinctions. The first is the distinction between deindustrialization and coal and the coal industry. I, I think for a long time the coal industry has seen to has come to be seen to symbolize deindustrialization. But if you look at it from a different angle, then deindustrialization or the then the coal industry is an energy industry. And energy is needed for a, po- for a deindustrializing society or even for a post-industrial society, just as much as it is for an industrial society. So I think it's actually productive to disrupt that close link between deindustrialization and the coal industry. As a matter of fact, if you look at it globally, a lot of our economy in the present, globally speaking, is still powered by coal. We don't live in a deindustrialized age, globally speaking, either. But the point is, by the 1960s, the main market for coal was electricity generation. So the and electricity was needed for a post-industrial economy just as much as it was needed for an industrial economy. So I think that is the first distinction that I find productive to kind of think about. So disrupt that close link between deindustrialization and the coal industry. The second distinction is we should probably distinguish between the coal industry as an industry and the future and the trajectory of the industry and the experience and the future of the people working in that industry, i.e. the coal miners. And coming back to your question about 1984, I find it is most productive to start the history of the miners' strike not in 1984, but to look back at the long durée and in particular focus on the 1970s. The 1970s witnessed a renaissance of the industry, a new dawn for the industry, and that had tangible consequences materially for the people working in the industry, but it also had consequences for the way that the miners looked at their prospects in the future. So it was in the 1970s that they were promised jobs for life, that they were promised big money, that they were promised a job that would have meaning to them. There's there's an interesting gender dimension to this as well. And I think if we want to understand the perspective of the miners in 1984, then it is important to look at the confidence that they had been invested into the industry in the 1970s, that they were hoping, they were not hoping for 
some kind of con consensual phasing out of coal, they believed that there was a future for the coal industry. And of course, Arthur Scargill, the leader of the coal miners, articulated that belief quite forcefully. Plus also the miners had something to lose in terms of um, newfound affluence and newfound material comfort. It was well-paying jobs. So, and of course, all of this was playing out within the context of a major recession of deindustrialization as a process happening all around them. But the miners' industrial muscle, their industrial power, had shielded them quite successfully, at least comparatively successfully, from the ravages of deindustrialization that they saw happening all around them. So by 1984, the miners at the coal industry and the miners and their union had acquired a political and symbolic significance quite beyond the industry itself. So that issue of that kicked off the miner strike, that proposal to close 20 collieries with loss of 20,000 jobs, everybody knew that this was not the real reason that the strike was fought over. And that was not what was at stake. You know, what people invested it with was um, really the reordering or how British society should work in the context of the 1980s. So as you say, the um, the culture was changing. How how did this affect um, individual miners? And what was their experience like during the strike? Was it more, how did they express that fight for their own culture rather than simply their jobs? Well, again, I think we need to probably introduce um, some distinctions here. A lot of the public memory, a lot of the, the literature that was produced in the 1980s and subsequently has um, focused on the activist part of the National Union of Mine Workers. You know, those people who were really committed, who battled with the police on the, on the picket lines, who were devoted to Arthur Scargill as a leader that they heroized. You know, they, they, he was a hero for them. There was this saying, Arthur Scargill walks on water. So and in even the footage now, you can see something of kind of the, the confidence that he inspired in them. And um, a former miner told me, I would have took a bullet for Arthur. So the, the kind of the way that they saw him as an embodiment of a certain type of trade unionism and um, his principled stance. But of course, if you look at the 180,000 men on colliery books, that was perhaps 10 percent. You know, they, the people who were being mobilized in the strike to go on the picket lines, to go to all grief and all those other places. Now, the other um, aspect or the other segment of the workforce that has been quite a lot of emphasis on is the people who refused not to strike or who refused to go on strike. So who, who carried on working, who at the time itself by the Thatcher government, of course, were held up as the true heroes of the strike. They're now kind of often seen in rather different terms. But they they were about, you know, and obviously that was um, a segment of the workforce that changed um, throughout the duration of the strike. So the coal board and the government very much focused on increasing the number of people returning to work. But I guess um, not enough emphasis has been placed in, on that large group in between, on people who for whatever reason did not, or heeded the call for strike action, but withdrew into their own kind of private sphere and did not really become involved in activism. You know, and that is probably the, the group that more research needs to be done on. And so to answer the question, the experience of miners can then not be compressed into one single experience, a very kind of different experience. And of course, there were certain expectations working on all of them. And maybe we can talk about a tension here between being a good trade unionist, being true or being loyal to your community or sometimes being loyal to your immediate family that might support you, but also might say, well, hang on, now we've been going without a wage for months and months. Shouldn't we can look out of an individual way out of this? That's fascinating to, to think about. What do you think there is to explore there in scholarship? Where, what do you think has been most untapped about those experiences? Well, I think what it will, I mean, obviously they are quite hard get at in in terms of they are quite those voices are quite hard to recover 
and there's a trend in contemporary scholarship to look at oral history, you know, to kind of interview the, the people who lived through the strike. But often what you then, and then you contact people who were involved in the strike and they ask other people. So it is the people for whom the strike really was very important and mattered and who 40 years on still take this as the defining moment of their life. A little bit the people who were ambivalent about the whole thing, they don't have these kind of heroic tales to tell about the strike. You know, it's more like, trying to become invisible, perhaps, and trying not to be noticed and finding a way to meddle your way through that collision of different forces. And a lot of them did not choose to be part of this. You know, it um, they just had to find a way to, to survive. So how can we access those voices? It's probably easier to access them by looking at source material from the time itself rather than trying retrospectively um, interview people about how they felt at the time. But, but often it is a reading between the lines or a reading against the grain, because there were a lot of um, pressure was put on them to both by the coal board, because that is the weak link in the chain that the coal board wanted to work on, but also by the NUM, by the miners leader saying, well, why are you hiding behind your lace curtains? You need to be out here. And all sorts of ideas of masculinity were also attached to this. You know, if you want to be a real man, you should be fighting it out with the police. Don't be kind of um, sitting at home watching television. Yeah. So in some respects, it is a challenge uh, recovering those voices. But I think um, it's also worthwhile because it would uh, introduce a degree of ambivalence and complexity to the story of the minor strike. And in particular, it could also be a negotiation of about how some people might have been reluctant to join the strike, in part because they weren't given the chance to vote, um, to have a ballot for the strike, but then still fell in line because they believed at the end of the day, they should follow what the union told them to do. And this is how they should repay the debt to their community. But I mean, it would be fascinating to look at, at diaries from the time by exactly those people who were not in the spotlight. Yeah. It's interesting, definitely. I mean, um, from relatives I've asked about the, the minor strike, the key anecdote I was told is that um, he believes he was the only person in South Yorkshire to buy a new car during the strike. But, yeah. you know, things like that. He didn't tell me about Scargill or, or picket lines, really. He told me about, you know, how he got a good deal on a car. They can yes. turn down. Um, so it's um, it is fascinating I mean, to the, catch those oral uh, oral history perspectives. Yes. Well, of course, that would be a fascinating perspective because it might also call into question maybe the significance somewhat of these images that we have of the strike. I mean, maybe it was possible to live through that moment or through that year without actually taking it to be that life changing and that history changing moment. I suppose that's how I feel about living through the pandemic. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so how did um, the experience of deindustrialization and the decline of coal in Britain compare with um, perhaps Europe or elsewhere in the world, especially during 1984 to five? Well, of course, the minor strike became a symbol of a big confrontation even during 1984 itself. So I think it was mythologized at the very moment that this happened. All participants in the strike believed that these events were of momentous significance. And it is quite striking how that has radiated or how this has spread to other national contexts that they also look towards the British miners' strike as somehow this pivotal um, moment. I think if we want to look at, in a, from a social historical and a political historical perspective, in a comparative perspective, the conflict and the conflictual element of the minor strike and contrast with, let's say, the more consensual managing of a certain decline of the industry in Germany and some, some other places. So, but of course, that came from both sides. Is precisely because the miners and their representatives believed that it was a future for coal. That's why they thought it was worth fighting for it. And the other side, of course, it believed it was very important to defeat the National Union of Mine Workers politically and also them to be seen to be defeated. They didn't want to compromise. And I think that's quite clear when you look at the fires of the, of the Thatcher government. 
within the German context, it was never that belief that the coal industry had that future. So, so the union itself said, well, as long as we get deals for the individual miners to get their redundancy money, and you know, as long as they are being looked after, we are okay with phasing out that industry. And then the, the political side also said, well, this is a deal we can agree on. You know, we we subsidize the long decline, but you don't cause any trouble politically. You don't challenge us politically. And so the conflict was kind of absent in other places, and in particular in West Germany, um, by, in the rural area by the 1980s. Compared to France, um, Belgium, some other Western Union, there the coal industry had long been considered on its way out. You know, there the, the big struggles are from previous um, decades. Globally speaking, what is striking, if you look at the evidence, it is actually during the 1980s and 1990s. So the very moment that in Britain, the coal industry is um, drastically cut back or coal output is drastically cut back, global coal production explodes. Now, I mean, in, in, and that holds for today. I mean, in 2023, there was more coal produced the world over than ever before. Eight billion tons of coal. You know, half of which produced in China. So in some respects, it's a very European, that rundown of the coal industry is a very European story. If you look at other markets, India, China, some other places, exactly something very different happened. No, that's fascinating, especially as um, we consider that I, I, I had no idea that more coal was being produced than ever, especially as um, at the climate summits, the big uh, stumbling block is the agreement to phase out coal that yes. seems to be where it always falls down yes. um, and um what is your key moment from um from the minor strike or perhaps the the industrialization process in mm. general well there are many important moments in the strike itself but to maybe underline the argument I was trying to make earlier, I would say the key moment of the minor strike didn't happen in 1984 at all but happened in 1972 and that is the Battle of Saltley Gate. You know, when what Arthur Scargill described as the um, the greatest moment in, in his life and the greatest moment of uh, British kind of trade union history, when the miners were supported by other industrial workers to stop um, the movement of coal at that um, Coke depot at, in Birmingham. And why do I say is that important for 1984, 1985? Because both sides, the NUM and the government and the NUM wanted to recreate that moment of Saltley Gate. And that, of course, was at all grief. That's where they thought that they had the opportunity to recreate that moment of 1972. And the government were terrified about the idea of the miners actually, re of history being repeated. And there's a, a wonderful file where Margaret Thatcher says, the events of, uh, early in the strike in March 1984, the events of Salt Lake Gate are being repeated and sh that she was most disturbed by this. And this is how when she um, instructed the police you know, to stop the miners from reaching the sites that they wanted to picket. So when they really wrapped up the, um, the police action during the strike so that the miners would not be able to repeat that victory from 1972. It is a striking when you look at the history of the coal miners and the coal industry from the late 60s to 1984 and beyond, how much they were influenced by certain understandings of the past and how much the NUM wanted to repeat that victory of 1972 and also the lessons they had learned from 1981 when there was a previous confrontation with the government, with the Thatcher government, which they had won. And on the, the side of the government, how much they were terrified from history repeating itself. So their first goal in the strike was to stop the miners of repeating the humiliation that they had inflicted on the Heath government in the 1970s. So in that respect, I would say actually the key moment is 1972 or the memory of 1972. At the same time, of course, there are also individual moments early in the strike. And I would say that decision to escalate the strike by a combination of pressure from below and bottom-up mobilization of the activists and um, deciding not to call a national ballot, opened up an opportunity for the government to exploit those divisions that they never thought would have appeared. 
that they, that the government couldn't believe their luck, that the miners were not united themselves. Because in some respects, the government too had bought into all these myths of the coal miners as being a uniquely cohesive body of men and a con uniquely cohesive force, you know, that they had tremendous industrial muscle. And when they noticed that there was division among the miners' ranks, they were quick to exploit this. So in that respect, the inability of the union to unite all members of the NUM behind that particular strike action sowed the seeds of the defeat. Because everything, all the um, a lot of the, the violence that followed and the mobilization of the police, if the miners had been united, then there would have been no need to picket collieries in Nottinghamshire or, or elsewhere. So I think that was... Um, it opened up an opportunity for the other other side to exploit those rifts. Some people had seen it coming. Some people had kind of warned of this. But um, I think on the part of the leadership of the NUM, there was just this confidence that they could create that momentum that sweep would sweep everything before it. Yes. Uh, well, you anticipated my next question. I was going to ask whether you thought it was solely the NUM's naivety and feeling invincible after bringing down the Heath government, or whether you thought um, it was the preparedness of uh, the National Coal Board and the Thatcher government in stockpiling coal and learning the lessons from the 70s. But I guess that it's a bit more of a mix of the two. Yes. Well, I wouldn't call it naivety on the part of the um, of the NUM, of the leadership. I would call it self-confidence and perhaps mm with a too much self-confidence. So it is about, it's, it's all about learning the lessons of the past. And the lessons of the past that they had learned was that mass picketing could yield results, which of course is a particular interpretation of the 1972 strike, which I don't think that if you look at what brought about the victory of the miners in 72 is actually due to Salt Lake Gate, but this is what the NUM leadership had learned. And plus they also thought, because for a long time in the 70s, there was internal division between what was called the moderates and the militants or the, or the left wing and the moderate wing. And by 1984, of course, the leadership was a united left wing leadership and what they called the Troika. So they believed that since we have that unity of leadership, we are in, in the stumbling block, which is the moderates and the right who were never kind of on board with militant action. We've got them out of the way so we can move forward and with confidence. Mick McGahey said that 1984 was the most fantastic strike that he'd ever been in um, because they had all these kind of activists from below and united leadership from above, or the, at least the, um, the, the president and the general secretary and the vice president. But of course, the, the, and I think what is striking about the, the miners and the, the way the conduct of the strike, and here too, Seems strange that after all these years of research, but more research could be done on the day-to-day -day handling of the strike. I don't mean the negotiations, but in terms of how they responded when they were confronted with facts that they had not anticipated. And there, you, I think you can say that the government, it, it is remarkable how seriously they took that strike, how often they met, how flexible they were in responding and in exploiting kind of the weaknesses that they saw on the other side. So they looked at the miners as a formidable antagonist and they really did create all these resources to defeat the miners. I think there can be no doubt about this. But to me, the, the turning point of this is 1981 rather than the Ridley report of the 1970s. It is really after that humiliation of 1981 that the, the government starts stockpiling coal, that they start thinking really kind of strategically, how can we, if this event occurs again, how can we defeat the miners? And I think the, the miners, um, or at least the leadership of the miners, they really did think they could, um, they had the confidence and maybe they were over overconfident in defeating the government. Um, I think they also thought that they could do it alone for a long time. It was quite a while before they saw the, um, the support of other, the, the trade union congress and other parts of of the labor movement. And, you know, it's more like they demanded of them to support them. It's not that they entered into any negotiation and how can we support us until very late in the strike. Yeah. So I think there is a, in some respects, they had also kind of bought into the myth of the invincibility of the miners and they believed in that. 
What do you think the legacy of the 1984 to 1985 miners' strike is today? I think that is a that is a difficult um, question to answer. It is, of course, in some respects, um, Arthur Scargill and others were proved right. And I don't mean this by saying, well, they predicted the rundown of the coal industry. In, in that respect, I'm not sure whether if they'd won the strike, if we'd now have a 200 um, million ton kind of coal industry uh, annual output to coal industry in Britain and whether that would even be a good thing. But they certainly, certainly were proved right in turning this into a symbol and a myth that sometimes you stand up, you know, when you kind of stand, it's better to go down fighting than kind of to fade away. I mean, it's, it is the coal miners that are remembered. It is the coal miners, the 40th anniversary of the miners' strike that we remember. So many people lost their jobs in the 1980s. So many industries disappeared. But it's still, despite everything, it is still the coal miners that, you know, have this aura and that mystique. And of course, that was created in the 1980s itself and subsequently in the historical, the historiography of it. The memory of the strike and the historiography of the strike was very much shaped by sympathetic left-leaning academics who were very much invested in where they'd lost the strike and or at least the union had lost the strike but they wanted to win the, the battle over the memory of the strike and the the thatcher government itself and all those people who supported them they were curiously disinterested in shaping a memory of the strike and if you look at the popular representations of the strike you know that side of the government is no longer you know there on equal terms you know their kind of framing of the strike has kind of disappeared. So a lot of the, I, I guess, the public memory of the strike is broadly sympathetic to the striking miners, whereas, whereas during the time of the strike itself, it was a deeply divided public opinion on it and, and certainly kind of published opinion was very negative and very critical of the miners. Now, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing for British political discourse is not for me to decide, but it certainly is a fact that it is still a major reference point, even 40 years on. And that, of course, by itself is quite a remarkable um, achievement. And with the rapid development in green technology and things such as artificial intelligence, always in the news, always on the rise, what lessons do you think we should take from the miners' strike and the industrialization in general to perhaps any future disruption that we sometimes see reported that robots will take our jobs and sensationalist headlines such as that what what lessons can we learn well i mean <laughs> one could say that um yeah i mean some of those fears of course are well founded or well, were well founded in terms of your jobs becoming being phased out yeah, I mean, it, of all people, it was Enoch you know, Powell who in 1984 made that kind of comment that the miners play out the drama of the nation as a whole. And so maybe the experience of the miners might be an experience that awaits other sectors of society and um, types of workers at different moments in time. And, you know, it was the, the coal industry in the 1980s and the 2020s. It might well be um, service workers, it might well be university lecturers or, or other people who become redundant. So in that respect, I think there's a lot to be not so much learned from it, but um, it is something that relates their experience to our experience. In terms of policy lessons, political lessons, I would agree with you know, a lot of the, the scholarship that would argue that it is probably better to manage these things consensually, like through a consensus rather than through a confrontation. Because I think what is remarkable when you look at the policy documents of the Thatcher government from the 1980s onwards, or even the early 1980s, they always thought of the coal miners and in particular the union as a potential adversary and, a, and an antagonist. Never did they think that maybe there's a, a common shared interest in developing a certain type of energy industry and maybe we could work together. They always kind of prioritize confrontation over cooperation and working together. And um, it caused a lot of hurt um, on, on many sides. So I would say that lesson that is to be learned you know, try for the consensus or, you know, cooperation is, is better than, not always, but in this instance, kind of better than than uh, than conflict. As far as deindustrialization goes, I think deindustrialization as a global phenomenon is a myth. There is no, um, I would argue with David Edgerton, that more stuff 
and more kind of plastics and stuff of all types is being produced today than ever before. It's just that it's produced elsewhere and gets imported to Britain and, and Germany and other places. Thank you very much. It's been, um, it's been great talking to you, Jörg. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Jack. Our next guest is Natalie Tomlinson, Associate Professor of Modern British Cultural History at the University of Reading, who has recently co-authored Women in the Miners' Strike, 1984 to 1985, with Florence Sutcliffe Braithwaite. Hello, Natalie, and welcome along. Hey, it's lovely to be here. So just to kick this off, I wanted to find out what kind of roles uh, did women play in the miners' strike of 1984 to 5? Well, it depends which sort of women that we're talking about. So I'd say women from coalfield communities got involved in different ways. I think it's really important to realise that the majority of women in coalfield communities didn't get involved in um, explicit political activism or support groups for the strike, but some did. So the sort of numbers of women who got involved in these sorts of women support groups and groups that were affiliated to women against pit closures, difficult to put an exact figure on, but we're probably looking about 5% of, of women in mining villages, which is not a huge number, but it is quite a large number in terms of, if you think about the amount of people who were extremely involved in activism overall, it was you know a significant phenomenon. And those women became involved in, in various different activities. So the most well-known thing that women in support groups did during the strike was, was activities around fundraising to feed striking miners and their families. And so often fundraising activities covered a whole um, array of things. Um, and the money raised would be used to run either soup kitchens, basically canteens, which were themselves um, staffed by these women, uh, I say staff, obviously, we run on a totally voluntary basis, uh, who would prepare and cook the food. Sometimes that money instead went to make food parcels instead. Um, that was particularly the case in areas where miners tend to live in sp quite spread out communities like the South Wales Valleys. Soup kitchens rather um, worked rather better in areas that were like traditional pit villages where everyone lived quite close to each other. Also, sometimes people raise money for um, people to have vouchers for local shops as well to buy food. So that was the sort of biggest nucleus of activity. But also for women who were involved in support groups, some became quite involved in going on things like political rallies and demonstrations. And some also went on the picket line at pits, which was seen to be really quite, um, in some ways that would seem to challenge certain gender norms. Because if you've ever seen um, film footage of uh, picket lines during the miners' strike, they were quite violent places sometimes. Um, they were obviously heavily male dominated because mining being a male profession. And, and quite a lot of... Um, some men were very unhappy about women being on the picket line. Sometimes that was sexism. And sometimes it was, I think, stemmed from a more genuine sort of place of concern and fear for their wives and daughters. Um, so that was seen to sort of slightly upend gender norms. Although I also think it's quite complicated. We talk about this quite a lot in our book. Because in sometimes those women on picket lines were often suggesting that they were taking the place of men and they, they were having to be men and the men going to work were unmanly. So there's certain ways in which also women being on the picket line sort of um, played into quite traditional notions of, of the gender order as well. So we've got a sort of rain, a range of activities that those women who became involved in supporting the strike got involved in. But of course, most women weren't involved in actively supporting the strike in terms of groups. Nevertheless, many women would support the strike in other ways at home. So often there's, of course, the moral support of giving uh, your husband or your father or your brother or whatever, um, you know, your support for them being on strike. But also this is an era, and I think this is very significant, where far more women are going out into the paid labour force than we had seen previously. And it was really significant that it happens in, at this point in the early 80s where the majority of women are, once their children have gone to school, are out in the paid labour force. Most women were bringing in at least some cash to the household with their own paid work. Um, quite a lot of women did things like increase their hours or take on other jobs so that their family could keep going. And again, something that we argue in the book, something that's really underappreciated in the literature about the miners' strike, but it was this transition to women being in the paid labour force, which was one of the things that enabled the strike to go on for so long. And then, of course, finally, we have to remember the women who didn't support the strike at all, who were either annoyed that their husbands were out on strike, or in coalfields like Nottinghamshire, where most people remained at work, simply supported their husbands in what was quite a difficult time also for working miners, in that they often had to face quite violent picket lines and such like that. So there was a, there was a huge 
um, array of experiences. You interviewed quite a number of these women for your book. And are there any experiences that particularly resonated with you? I don't know if resonates the right word, but there was a few experiences that really stood out. So we interviewed, you know, nearly 100 people. And of course, some people had amazing stories to tell and some people's lives were much quieter. Certainly in terms of the activists, um, certainly someone whose interview is is really interesting. He's got amazing stories in it. It's a woman called Aki Curry, who is from Doncaster, who um, was a huge activist in um, the support group for Mark and Main Colliery, which is the colliery for the pit village of Armthorpe. And um, she became very involved in going on picket lines and going on demonstrations and was arrested, she told us, 13 times. Occasionally the number changes, but around 13 times during the course of the strike. Uh, so she told us these stories and she's an amazing raconteur. Um, so just hearing about her sort of clashes with the police, her experiences being arrested was amazing. Just, just, just super interesting to hear. Uh, we interviewed Anne Scargill and Betty Cook for the book together. So Anne Scargill was was Arthur Scargill's wife at the time of the strike, although they later divorced. Um, Betty who was also from the same area of Woolley near Barnsley. And um, they got to know each other through their pit closures activism and have become best friends. And Anne and Betty are probably the best known activists of the strike. Um, they stayed active in Women Against Pit Closures for 30 years. They're very involved in activism against the 92-93 round of pit closures. And quite recently, they've published a joint autobiography together called United Against the Struggle. But what was actually really striking to me was actually the strength of their friendship and how much they had supported each other through various difficult periods in each other's lives. And that was actually the thing that I took most from, from interviewing them. There's another great story, a woman that our uh, research assistant, Victoria, interviewed in Scotland, Anne Kirby, who's very, very involved in supporting the strike in the coalfield of Fife. Uh, later on in life, when she divorced her first husband, who had been a striking minor, uh, she latterly married a man who'd been a policeman at Orgreave. And even now, they still disagreed about the strike and the policing of it, but they, she had nevertheless found love in this very unusual space. So that was just a story which was just really striking to hear, I think. Uh, so there's all these sorts of little amazing stories, but I think what's also really important to say is that the quieter stories that we heard of the strike, so most women's stories of the strike were less dramatic than that, and often they were just stories of quiet struggle, of the sort of constant, the constant battle to put food on the table in, in a situation which was just extremely difficult. And those stories didn't necessarily always have huge dramatic arcs to them, but they were really, really important stories to hear because that was really the story that I think more people would, would have had during the strike, right? Most people didn't have these amazing tales of daring do of being incredibly involved in activism. For most people, it was a, a quieter struggle, but a struggle nonetheless. So it was really great to hear that range of stories. You briefly touched on it earlier, but your book uh, discusses some of the divisions between not only men and women during the strike, but also uh, differences between those involved in the women's liberation movement and those involved in the women's support movement. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, so it's sort of quite a complex picture about political activism and the strike, partly because a lot of women from coalfield communities who became involved in activism during the strike, often there was a reluctance amongst those women to call themselves political. So that was complicated, although other women like Anne and Betty would have taken that label on quite happily. There was a lot of women in the women's liberation movement in 1984. This was still going quite strong from its heyday in the early 70s. You know, that most of these women were also socialists. They wanted to help the strike. And they were very enthusiastic about the growth of the women's support movement in the coalfield communities because they saw it as an expression of working class women's autonomy and independence. But they also saw it as maybe a sort of working class feminism, right? Or maybe that it could become a sort of working class feminism. And so quite a few people from the women's liberation movement became quite involved in supporting the strike and would go down to various uh, mining communities and, and help out. And it's quite interesting because most of the stories that we have about that are from women from the women's liberation movement rather than from women in coalfield communities, right? Because women from the women's liberation movement tended to be more middle class, more, have more access to the sort of resources that you would need to tell your life story and to have that imprint on an oral history 30 or 40 years later. And if you hear it from the sort of the side of the women's liberation movement, it's very much 
framed in this sense of you know we had these amazing interactions and there was you know lots lots and lots of these sorts of really positive encounters but it's when we talk to women from the women's support movement I think it's important to note that firstly a lot of women didn't encounter women from the women's liberation movement at all because necessarily they probably only went to a few places so for some they hadn't really met these women at all and then that encounter could sometimes be a little bit tense or complicated I think it's really important to say that people generally really appreciated the help and the support and that understood that it was in good faith. Um, but sometimes it also felt to some of the working class women in the coal fields occasionally that they were maybe being preached to or that they were being told that they should be have a certain array of political beliefs that weren't quite the same as their own political beliefs or that they were being labelled in a certain way that they felt a little bit uncomfortable with. So, yeah, it was it was it was complicated. Uh, read the book to find out more. That's a good uh, bit of promo in there as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I also wanted to, to find out a little bit more about the experience of women um, who were on the side of those who continued to work or mm -hmm. perhaps were related to or even married to uh, strike breakers. Do you um, do you have any examples of this you could tell us about? We did. So we interviewed um, women whose husbands or fathers had broken the strike. And I would say there were two distinct groups of women who'd gone through this experience. So firstly, we have the groups with women in coal fields that were mostly places where the strike didn't really penetrate, like Nottinghamshire, where most people continued to work. And the experiences of those women in some ways, weirdly mirrored the experiences of women in, in communities that were very strong for the strike in that they also saw themselves as defending their community and their right to work, as they put it. And in fact, one woman that we interviewed in from the Nottinghamshire village of, of Calverton, in fact, set up her own uh, support group run by women for men having to go through uh, picket lines because she said they were traumatised by it. And it's really funny because, of course, we, we interviewed this woman who remains anonymous in the book. And she was quite, unsurprisingly, quite against the strike. But it also seemed to me that this support group that they'd set up to help their men to deal with the trauma of these violent picket lines was, of course, an exact mirror image of, of the support movement set up to set, help striking minors. And I also think it's, to be honest, quite likely that had this woman lived in a striking community, she would have actually got very involved in the, um, in the movement to support the strike, right? So it becomes all around these sort of these ideas of defending your community, that, that becomes really important. But there wasn't the sense of them necessarily breaking the community's code or going against the grain of what was right. And then there was another group of women that we interviewed whose husbands or fathers had broken the strike in communities that were really strong for the strike. So we only interviewed three or four women for whom this was the case. And although this group of women was small in number, they were probably some, I think, of the most interesting interviews we had for the project because those stories are hardly ever heard. It's a story with a huge stigma attached to it. I think it's very significant that the women we interviewed who um, had this situation were still extremely keen on being very anonymous. Their embargoes and all their interviews because the repercussions for their family were so serious at the time, right? So one woman that we interviewed in the Northeast, she was 10 when her father went back to work and um, their, their windows in the house, for example, got bricked in and uh, people in their community stopped talking to them. Um, so that was, I really think, had been a cause of deep trauma for her. Um, another woman that we interviewed from South Wales, her father went back to work three weeks before the strike ended. So South Wales was the coal field, which was the strongest, uh, most or most solid for the strike. 99% of miners there remained on strike for the, for the duration. So it was particularly stigmatised there to, to go back to work and when her father went back to work they had a, a policeman on guard outside their house every day and she said that to tell her story for the project was she called it an exorcism and she said that's how dramatic it felt for her because she felt she had never really been able to to tell her story that there's not really a framework for people to put these stories in because it's a story that's swept under the under the carpet it's seen as shameful right so I was so pleased that those women were brave enough to come forward and to share those stories with us. That's a really incredible insight, really. And one thing I've I've taken from these interviews is uh, how strong the sense of community was during the strike. Um, would you say that 
sort of the women involved in either supporting or even um, those across the picket line? Do you think they were almost the cornerstone of keeping this community or what people refer to as the miners' community? It's a really good question. So I certainly think that the support groups were really key in keeping the strike going for a year, right? It, it simply wouldn't have been possible. And I think it's also significant that the sort of women who tended to get involved in support groups were often the sort of women who were sort of active in the community in various ways. So sometimes these women were often quite involved in the trade union movement and had a sort of political educational background in organising from that. So they were often the women who would get a group off the ground. And often the sort of women who would join in, whether or not they saw themselves as political or capital P, were often the sort of people who, for example, might have been involved in play groups. There was one woman we interviewed in Doncaster who had been very involved in, for example, raising money in the community for a wheelchair for a local girl who was disabled. Not political activities, but very community minded. And so the women who got involved, I think, were women who were community minded, who tried to keep things going and often would try to keep things going after the strike. And in fact, there's a really interesting example. This isn't someone we interviewed for the project. In fact, I think she's died. But a woman called Norma Dolby um, in a village called Arkwright Town in Derbyshire which was a village which was split 50-50 between strikers and non-strikers. She was very involved during the strike itself in supporting the strike and in, in, in the support group. But after the strike ended, she really perceived the need to try and, and heal the rifts in her community and try and bring people back together, whichever side they were on. And that again, that's a story that's heard very little about as well. But I think it's significant that it was a woman in a support group who saw it as her job to try and bring this broken community back together. I just wanted to to ask you, What's the legacy of women's roles in the minor strike? And did this have any long term effects on feminism in Britain? That's a really complex question. I think often there's a there's a quite a strong narrative around the strike that for those women who got involved, it changed their lives. And I think something that myself and Florence try and do in the book is try and interrogate that a little bit, actually. Um, I think we have to understand the activism of those women who got involved in the support groups during the strike as as really a product of, in many ways, of the changes that women in post-war Britain had experienced, right? So the fact that women were able to get involved in this way in the first place is due to a sort of greater public space for women to speak. Women are also able to support the strike in other ways, even if they're not active in the strike, through the fact that they're going out into the paid labour force more often. After the strike's end, there was a number of women a minority, but, you know, a significant minority of women who returned to education, actually, you know, sort of went into white collar jobs, experienced a degree of social mobility. And again, some of those women, oh, there's a narrative that that's because of the strike. But we also see these sorts of shifts and stories happen in, in working class communities across the country. So really what we're seeing is the story of a cohort of working class women, really the boomer generation and the ways in which the welfare state and the changing economic circumstances of Britain shape their lives in ways which I think were much stronger, to be honest, than anything that the minor strike could have really ever affected. Um, so in that sense, I think we have to see women's women's activism in the strike as a, a sign of, of the changes that women had experienced rather, rather than a cause of it. Um, so in a way, we have a scepticism about this narrative that the, the strike changed women's lives, particularly because often the women who got involved in that sort of activism had, had been active in, in trade union movements beforehand. However, what is also important to say that it is clear that for the women who did get involved in that sort of activism, they often talk about it facilitating a sense of greater independence, of, of greater, um, I guess, a sort of a greater autonomy or a greater sense of self. But certainly, I think it's clear that for some women who became more actively involved in supporting the strike or who took on extra work to support their family, the experience of doing this facilitated a greater sense of power and independence than they had had previously. So these aren't necessarily hugely dramatic shifts. But nevertheless, they were significant for the women who experienced them, right? So in that sense, it had this sort of significance on the individual level for some of these women. And I don't really, I mean, in terms of its impact on feminism, I don't know really whether there was a huge impact on feminism. Certainly it might have um, expanded the lens of some feminists to think about what was happening to women in these deindustrializing communities. And of course, uh, on, on the other hand, it may have encouraged a, a, a few women who've been involved in, this, in the 
support movement from coal communities to become interested in feminism. But I think it's quite hard to sort of isolate any particular causes and effects there. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Natalie. It's been great having you on and I've learned a lot. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Our third and final guest today is Stephen Brooke, Professor of History at York University, Toronto, and the author of London 1984, Conflict and Change in the Radical City. Hello and welcome along, Stephen. Thanks so very much. So 1984 was quite a tempestuous year for Britain. Can you briefly describe the situation in London and situate that within the wider context of Britain in the 1980s? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the starting points is always the accession to power of Margaret Thatcher and her conservative government in 1979. And I think by the mid-1980s, by 1984 and 1985, what's becoming clear is how radical a political change that is. And that government uh, seeks to really very much kind of radically revise the post-war settlement, which, you know, in kind of general terms had been social democratic based upon a welfare state and full employment. Thatcher government comes in and wants to introduce the free market uh, in a very uh, vigorous way, uh, to put it mildly, by withdrawing subsidies from industry, allowing unemployment to rise, and also um, tries to undermine, I think, in many ways, the state's responsibility. So there is this immediate change that's appearing in the mid 1980s. But I think that needs to actually put alongside a longer term change. And that comes out of things like longer term economic change, the deindustrialization of the British economy really from the 1960s and 1970s on. And also, I think the uh, sort of greater visibility of um, newer identities in British society. And, and what I would call attention to, for example, is the emergence of a multiracial society in the wake of post-war migration, the so-called Windrush generation, but also you could look at South Asian migration as well. And coming out of the 1960s, I think you also have, by the 1980s, a greater visibility of gay and lesbian identity in the wake of the decriminalization of homosexuality. And something that I think needs a lot of attention is the kind of consequences of greater power, greater equality for women in the 1970s and 1980s. Now, this is uh, not something that leads to, um, you know, complete equality. But what you have in the 70s and 80s are these long term changes that are beginning to appear in things like more women in the workplace, more women in positions of power. Margaret Thatcher is herself an example of that. So the mid 1980s are this very interesting moment, I think, where long term change and short term change come together. You mentioned in your book about the conflict between the Greater London Council and the Thatcher government. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, so the 1980s, as, as we all know, is a period of conservative dominance nationwide. I mean, certainly in national elections, the conservatives see off the Labour Party. But there are kind of pockets of Labour support at the local level. So if you look at London, for example, uh, most of the inner London boroughs are labor councils. If you look nationwide, there are major metropolitan uh, councils, such as the Greater London Council, but also Manchester, Liverpool, and Sheffield, that are labor run. So it's as if in this kind of landscape of conservative dominance, you have these oases of kind of labor support at the local level. And there is a conflict there because these labor governments take on the Thatcher government at the local level. In other words, they're they're not kind of uh, ready simply to kind of go along with Thatcherite social and economic change. They become kind of outcrops of labor opposition to uh, the conservative government. So they pursue policies that are very much against Thatcherite economic policies, such as putting money into local industry. Uh, they also fund a lot of, uh, for example, 
example, uh, anti-racist organizations. They fund a lot of organizations who are interested in, for example, gay and lesbian rights, a lot of women's organizations. So like I said, it's as if you have this outcrop of radical kind of leftist opposition to Thatcher. And of course, in London, that's summed up by uh, there's a very physical relationship between the two institutions of power. You have uh, the House of Commons on one side, Westminster on one side, and the Houses of Parliament on one side of the river. And straight across the river, you have County Hall. So it's as if these two bastions of power, one national, one local, are staring at each other uh, throughout the 1980s. That doesn't work for Thatcher and the Conservative government. They see these councils, and in particular, something like the Greater London Council, not only as political opponents, but also as wasting taxpayers' money. So in 1983, the Conservatives make a uh, election promise to do away with the Great GLC and Metropolitan Councils in Manchester, Liverpool, and Sheffield, and also rein back local government spending. And there's actually uh, is a very famous description that Thatcher made of the miners in 1983-1984 as the enemies within. And in the original iteration of that speech, she also referred to local government as one of the enemies within. So there's a political struggle going on at the local level. In 1983, the conservative government um, uh, begins to begin the process of abolishing metropolitan councils, which um, there's a struggle over in 1984 in um, the London area and over the Greater London Council. But of course, because of the Tory majority in the national government, that bill is going to go through and it's passed in 1986 and the GLC is abolished. So the larger political struggle in 1980s Britain is reflected at the local level in uh, London. And that uh, that fight in 1984 is a very intense one. Um, and it's brought to uh, the people of London through advertising, through political campaigns and so on. You mentioned a bit about the struggle there. And London was marred by several protests and strikes in 1984. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about these and what were the effects of strike action on London? Yeah, I mean, I, I probably would take a little bit of issue with, with the term marred. I mean, I think that London itself, there are demonstrations and there are some protests um, in 1984. The intense strike action is really happening outside of London in 1984. If you look at the minor strike and most famously the, the Battle of Orgreave um, in June 1984, within London, um, there are uh, things like uh, anti-apartheid marches, which are protesting uh, the Thatcher government's uh, hosting the South African uh, prime minister in the spring of 1984. That's a that's one of the biggest um, political demonstrations in London in the 1980s. You also have things in 1984, such as, and this is again, this gives you a sense of the struggle between local government and national government, uh, the GL sponsoring a Jobs for Change pop concert in June 1984, which is effectively a kind of protest against Thatcherite um, economic policy. Throughout the year, um, I think there are also struggles at the local level, particularly over policing. But if you look at the period just before 1984 and, and the period just after 1984, you do see kind of the intensity of political and social tensions. I mean, most famously, I think, in 1981, you have the New Cross fire, which prompts a huge demonstration um, protesting against uh, the policing against black people in London. That's followed in the spring of 1981 with violent disorders in Brixton, which are again about the policing of black people and uh, in particular a policy called stop under uh, suspicion. And of course, after 1984, 
Those particular tensions are manifested in the 1985 Tottenham Broadwater Farm disorders, again, which are sparked by policing. A little bit later on, there is a very intense um, strike in London, which is uh, in Wapping. Uh, in the newspaper industry when there is an an attempt by News International, which is Rupert Murdoch's consortium of papers, to move to, um, you know, more uh, technologically enhanced printing, and that brings out uh, the printers. Like the minor strike, that's a failed strike, but in 1986, it's very much a kind of intense demonstration of the kind of tensions around Thatcherite social and economic change at this time. Are there any parallels between the strikes in London and um, the minor strikes in the North and in Wales? Yeah, I mean, I think that especially with Wapping, you know, what you're looking at is political change. In other words, the the Thatcher government is introducing um, trade union legislation, which actually makes it harder to go on strike and actually makes it harder to join a trade union. And then a capitalist enterprise, I mean, the the newspaper industry looking to take advantage of that to change work practices. And and that does close down a particular area of employment. Uh, as a printer, your your job is more threatened in 1986. I don't, it's, it's similar to, but not on the same scale as the minor strike. I mean, uh, one of the turning points in the 80s is definitely the National Coal Board's decision to start closing down collieries, which is an attempt really to to end a particular way of life, a particular uh, kind of work and a particular kind of community. Because of London's more complex economy, this is it doesn't happen in the same way. There is a larger economic change which does parallel what's going on in the north, which is the closure of the docklands in the late 1970s and early 1980s, which does create a lot of working class unemployment and again does foreclose uh, particular kinds of employment in London for working class people, which is a kind of parallel to what goes on uh, with the miner strike. Did those working class people in the docklands sort of feel any kinship with the miners, so to speak, or did they did they relate and did they even perhaps support the miners or vice versa? Yeah, there is support for the miners strike, particularly unsurprisingly among union organizations, labor organizations, and, you know, probably most famously because of the film Pride uh, from the gay and lesbian community. And in 1984, for example, there's a very big demonstration, um, which is talked about in another OUP book by Natalie Tomlinson and Florence Sutcliffe Braithwaite by um, the uh, women supporting the minor strike, including, you know, wives and mothers. So that's, there is a lot of support. I think that London is probably a more complex mirror in a way, or it's slightly different kind of mirror in a way because of its own economic problems. I think there's a lot more focus, for example, on those economic problems in London than, let's say, the minor strike. Uh, though there is support from the minor strike from the GLC, for example, very strong support, they're also focusing upon the unemployment generated by the Docklands. I think when you think of contemporary London, which is, you know, I think a, an economy right now that is vibrant, if very unequal. But I think we have to remember in the 1980s, um, London in the 1980s, uh, for the first time really in the 20th century, was an economy undergoing unemployment, undergoing a real shift from manufacturing to more service and finance. And it's a it's a period where uh, there is depopulation, um, unlike today. So in some ways, the the economic problems in London have a greater purchase at that point. I think as well, and, and I think this comes out in accounts of the minor strike, that London probably reflects the nation in that there are people who support the minor strike, there are people who are opposed to it, and there are people who are indifferent to it. Um, that may be different, you know, if you looked at the north, there would be greater support, but there are some areas within Britain, certainly obviously in areas where uh, miners go to work, where there is there is opposition to the strike. London, I think, mirrors the nation in that way and having a breadth of opinion there. 
So what is the legacy of all this change that London underwent in the 1980s? Yeah, it's a really it's a really um, good question, and I think it's a complex question. In the book, what I try and argue is that in this moment in 1984, there are kind of two Londons. Uh, one is representative of an older and newer social democratic tradition. And then there is another London that's being generated uh, in some ways by the Thatcher government, in particular being generated by its policies, which encourage finance. So the, the great physical example of that is the, the Docklands, which goes from being an area of working class employment to very much a symbol of global neocapitalism or neoliberalism, I should say. So. There are two Londons there. We we know which London emerged. It's really the second London, the, the kind of neoliberal London where the economy is very much about finance, very much about service. And physically, it's represented by gentrification, by development. And the impact of that is that it's a city that is exciting, cosmopolitan and expensive. Now, the book suggests, however, that that other London, that social democratic London, still exists, and you there are kind of echoes and afterlives of it. And the example that I use in the book is of a community garden called Calthorpe Gardens, which is explicitly a product of 1984. It is built in 1984 from local government money from uh, there are feminist groups involved is very much an example of the kind of alternative London you have in the 1980s that still exists it it still um, carries forward community programs but physically it is also in the shadow of a massive development at Mount Pleasant post office which is very much an example of neoliberal London, you know, it's a it's a development which is about creating high cost residences and offices and services. So it's very much an example of that. So today's London, I think, is a kind of complex relationship between this older London, which has echoes and afterlives, and this newer London, uh, which is very much the dominant one. But the other example I would use is that many of the things that drove radical London in the 1980s, gay and lesbian rights, um, anti-racist campaigns, feminism, are still with us today. They've become part of the political mainstream. Whether we think of um, you know, Pride Festival, the Notting Hill Carnival, for example, whether we think of ongoing discussions of gender equality, or even in you know the physical example of something like Gay's the Word Bookshop, which is a product of the 1970s and 1980s gay and lesbian rights movement um, is a kind of example of 1980s radicalism and is, of course, still with us today. So I think that London uh, today is a combination of those two Londons in the 1980s. Finally, what is the key moment that stands out to you from 1984? Well, I, that is a really great question. And I think if you're if you're speaking in terms of Britain nationally, it is definitely the decision, I think it's the 1st of March 1984, by the National Coal Board to close down collieries, because I think that that makes the struggle between Thatcherism and um, older traditions of, let's say, labor or working class communities, that makes it a national struggle. I think within London, I mean, I would point to two moments that I think are kind of you know, important. One is uh, the anti-apartheid rally in on the 2nd of June, 1984, which is an example, I think, of uh, anti-racism and whether at the local level and the global level becoming an incredibly important part of political discourse um, in Britain. So it's it becomes a kind of symbol of race and multiracialism and anti-racism becoming very much part of the political and social dialogue. I think for me, the other um, moment, which is a much quieter moment, but it's 
a, a radical daycare, the Dalston Children's Center, receiving 100,000 pounds as a grant from the GLC to uh, renovate what had been an old 1930s baths in uh, Dalston. And to me, that's a kind of a quiet but important moment because it says something about how local democracy worked at that point. What's missing today in London is a vibrant local democracy at the metropolitan level. In that moment, when the Dalston Children's Center gets 100,000 pounds to, to renovate a local building, you have a sense of how it works in the 1980s. A community group uh, trying to provide a material service to mothers, in this case, through childcare, run on anti-racist, anti-sexist principles being facilitated by a local government. So it's not statist. It's something that's a local government, local democracy, facilitating community organizers and individuals at the local level. And though that episode I don't think has ever made it into kind of mainstream history of Britain, I think that's a really critical moment. So for me, it's these two moments. One is very much global and one is fiercely local. And for me, that says something about uh, the kind of quality of politics in London in the 1980s, which I tried to capture in the book. Thank you. That was um, that was great. Uh, thank you for coming on. Well, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much, Jack, and it was really nice talking to you. We want to thank our esteemed guests for their thoughts and scholarship on the 1984 to 1985 miners' strike, written in the 1980s, and the strike's long-term effects on the politics, culture, economy, and environment of the United Kingdom. To learn more about the miners' strike, you can find all three books linked in the description below. Again, the featured books are. The British Miner in the Age of Deindustrialization, A Political and Cultural History by Jörg Arnold, Women and the Miner Strike, 1984 to 1985 by Florence Sutcliffe Braithwaite and Natalie Tomlinson, and London 1984, Conflict and Change in the Radical City by Stephen Brooke. This audio edition of Moments in History was produced by Stephen Philippi and myself, Jack Dugan. It can be found on SoundCloud and YouTube at Oxford Academic. Thank you for listening.